Welcome to episode 20 of the Self Care 101 podcast with your host, Pooja K. McClymont, helping people achieve their full potential with effective self care through wellbeing coaching. Thank you so much for listening today. On this episode, I'm going to address overthinking, why it's bad for your health, and how you can start taking steps today to manage it better. Look, the truth is, everyone overthinks sometimes. I've done it, you're probably doing it right now because you're listening to this podcast. But overthinking is a common issue, it's something that I address a lot in my coaching practice. People often come to their sessions saying things like, I can't relax, it's like my brain won't shut off, or I can't stop thinking about how my life could have been better if I'd done things differently. Now the link between overthinking and mental health problems is a chicken or egg type question. Overthinking is linked to psychological problems like depression and anxiety and if you procrastinate, overthinking plays a huge role here too. So let's look at overthinking for a minute. It's likely that overthinking causes mental health to decline and as your mental health declines, the more likely you are to overthink. Now that's a vicious downward spiral but it's hard to recognize that spiral when you're caught in the middle of it. In fact, your brain might try to convince you that worrying and ruminating is somehow helpful. (laughs) I've worked with clients sometimes and they're talking to me and I can hear their overthinking in the way they're trying to justify things to me. Now in a session, you don't need to justify anything to me. This is your time and you can work through anything you want, but I can hear them justifying everything that they're saying in response to any questions that I'm asking. It's it's quite a fascinating thing, to be honest. But look, you won't develop a better solution or prevent yourself from making the same mistake if you spend more time thinking. In fact, the opposite is often true. So analysis paralysis, now that is a real problem. I'm going to say that again. Analysis paralysis. Now with the overthinking, you're over analyzing every single thing. Did he call? Why didn't he call? Yeah, but we had a great night last night. So he should call. I only sent him a simple message. Why hasn't he called yet? Oh, why does my boss want to see me? I've done everything I was supposed to do. Everything's on time. I haven't had a fight with anybody. There shouldn't be any reason for my boss to be calling me in. Why is he calling me in? I don't understand why he's calling me in. And your feelings of misery, anxiety or anger, they can cloud your judgment and prevent you from taking positive action. Analysis paralysis. So there are two forms of overthinking. One is ruminating about the past. So that's when you're constantly thinking about the past and almost victim mentality comes into play here. So lots of, oh, but you know, it was like this when I was at this age and this happened then and and, oh, because that happened and this is why this is gonna happen. Or two, you're worrying about the future. Yeah, but if he's not earning that much money, yeah, but if I want to buy that house then I need to get that job today and if I don't get that job today then it's not gonna happen and I've got to do that because I also need to buy um, a car and I want to have a partner and then I wanna have kids and you're always in that state. And it's different than problem solving. Problem solving involves thinking about a solution. Overthinking involves dwelling on the problem. And obviously in my practice, I can hear this a lot. So a lot of the time when a client's coming to me and they are overthinkers, they are sitting there talking to me and I can literally, it's, it's, it's a weird little thing, but it's like I can hear their brains think like doing the thinking and Obviously their rationale, so your rationale when you're overthinking, isn't necessarily rational (laughs) as such, if that makes sense. Your rationale isn't rational when you're doing this overthinking. And overthinking is it's actually very different to self-reflection as well. So healthy self-reflection, now that's about learning something about yourself or gaining a new perspective about a situation and it's purposeful, which is something that we'll go into later on in the show but it's purposeful overthinking though it that involves dwelling on how bad you feel and thinking about all the things you have no control over and it's not going to help you develop new insight 
listen to that bit again. It's about all the things that you have no control over. So you're thinking about things that haven't happened yet, or you're thinking about things that have happened, but they're essentially things that you can't touch or control. Because anything that you can control, you can just get on and do it. But if you can't control it, that's when the overthinking comes into play. And then we enter this downward spiral of really unhealthy thoughts and you get into that whole analysis paralysis scenario. Now the difference between problem solving, self-reflection and overthinking isn't about the amount of time you spend in deep thought. Spending time in deep thought isn't necessarily a bad thing if you can compartmentalize the thoughts that are coming in. Time spent developing creative solutions or learning from your behavior, now that is productive. But time spent overthinking, whether that's 10 minutes or 10 hours, that won't enhance your life. You are never going to get the answers that you're looking for. You are never going to receive the solutions that you're looking for. So let's say you want to get a new job and you overthink applying for a job that might be slightly out of your league or it's going to be more on a promotional slant. If you start overthinking about the outcome, so the outcome could be you get the job or you don't get the job, right? There's only two outcomes in that scenario. If you overthink the, oh, you know, they're not going to give me the job because I haven't had enough experience or they're not going to give me the job because I haven't done this, but, oh, I should have done this in the interview and I should have said this and I put, should have put my covering letter more detailed and I should have addressed this and I should have sent the thank you note and all of that overthinking is not enhancing your life, it's actually making it a lot worse, a lot more stressful. And if you don't recognize that you have these overthinking behaviors, and what will happen is everything will feel so much more difficult and you will create this undue stress within you that doesn't need to be there. It really doesn't need to be there because the overthinking is something that you can control. It really is. So I wanted to look at some signs that you're an overthinker. So some of you listening today will probably recognize that you're over, you're an overthinker and everything that I'm saying is really resonating. I mean, here are some signs. When you become aware of your tendency to overthink things, you can take steps to take to make change. So first, you've got to recognize that overthinking does more harm than good. Okay, so you've got to recognize that it is not healthy for you to overthink. Sometimes people think that their overthinking somehow prevents bad things from happening. And they think if they don't worry enough or rehash the past enough, then somehow they'll encounter more problems. But the research is pretty clear. Overthinking is bad for you and it does nothing to prevent or solve problems. So do any of these signs sound familiar to you? I relive embarrassing moments in my head repeatedly. I have trouble sleeping because it feels like my brain won't shut off. I ask myself a lot of what if questions. I spend a lot of time thinking about the hidden meaning in things people say or events that happen. I rehash conversations I had with people in my mind and think about all the things I wish I had or hadn't said. I constantly relive my mistakes. When someone says or acts in a way I don't like, I keep replaying it in my mind. Sometimes I'm not aware of what's going on around me because I'm dwelling on things that happened in the past or worrying about things that might happen in the future. I spend a lot of time worrying about things I have no control over. I can't get my mind off my worries. So how can you deal with overthinking? If you recognize that you tend to get caught up in overthinking, don't despair. You can take steps to reclaim your time, energy, and your brain power. You could schedule time to worry. You could change the channel. There are several mental health tech exercises that can help you stop overthinking everything. But what can you actually do to stop overthinking? So I like I always say, <laughs> there's likely something from the past that triggers this behavior. And with that, it means you have a choice. You have a choice to stop it or to carry on. There's a meme about how many tabs you have open in your mind. So if there's multiple thoughts whirling around your mind all the time, it's going to not only affect your sleep, your decision making, it ultimately harms your mental well-being. And we can prevent this. 
let me tell you a little story. <laughs> when I was younger, my earliest association with overthinking came from my poor mum. <laughs> she gets blamed for a lot, but I <laughs> I hope she doesn't listen to my podcast, but she, she does. Our parents, unfortunately, you know, they're our first rule givers, value givers, and the way they raise us often affects the way we turn out as adults um <laughs> when you're doing any self-development work it's always important to recognize the difference between you and your thoughts and what might be a template that's been embedded from your past now my mum she would always say what will they think that anything I was doing or that I wanted to do she'd always refer to this so it became a fully ingrained template of mine. I still have it. It hasn't completely disappeared. So sometimes I do like second guess my behaviors. And no matter what a person's behavior was towards me, I'd always second guess their motives. I would leave situations with friends, work or family thinking, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Why did I say that? What does she think of me? Should I apologize? Do I care? And then that would then feed into my sleep and I wouldn't be able to rest my mind. I'd be constantly second guessing myself. I'd be constantly second guessing every interaction. Now, a lot has changed since I've been a kid. I still mess up conversations by saying the wrong thing, not thinking before I speak or overstepping. And it's something that I'm actively working on, but you know what, I'm not perfect. None of us are. And... <laughs> To a certain extent, like, I do wish that people in my life would give me a pass here and there. Because if you know me, so if you're one of my friends or family, and if you really, really know me, and you've got to know me over the years, you know that I lead from my heart. I always lead from love. I always come from a good place. But sometimes, how that computes with what comes out of my mouth <laughs> doesn't always marry up. And I've... I'm fully aware of this. I've always had communication issues, if you like, and I've worked on it for so many years and I'm still working on it and I'll probably work on it until I die. But I'm cool with that because I know that a lot of my behavior isn't really the way I want it to be. You know, when I leave a conversation with a friend, so say I've had a chat with a friend, actually recently happened twice in the last few weeks. I was talking to a couple of friends and I shared something that I didn't need to say. I didn't need to say the conversation was about them and I should have kept it about them and maybe that's the difficulty between being a friend and a coach and trying to listen as a friend and not be a coach when you're talking to a friend but I said something on both occasions that afterwards I reflected and I thought oh, I shouldn't have said that that was not helpful for her and she's going to think that I'm comparing her to other people and it's not what I'm doing. I was just sort of saying that I, the, the intention was to say that I knew someone in a similar situation so that she didn't feel like her world was all encompassing and that the problems were so big that, you know, she, she couldn't go get past it. So yes, I still have it. Now, when I'm stressed, the overthinking is perpetuated and I have to really work on stopping it. Otherwise, I know I'm going to harm myself. Now, I do this by thinking about the thought and then I file it away. So I either file it away for later when I have more time to process it or by deciding there and then if I want it to remain in my mind. Because some things you might need to work through. So my to-do list, for instance, I'll look at my to-do list and then I'll get really annoyed at my husband because he's not doing anything on my to-do list and he could be doing some stuff. And then I can choose to overthink it or I can choose to deal with the thought and actually think about it, go through the, my husband is annoying process, <laughs> And then come back to, well, actually, I can do this, this and this, and I can tell him to do this, this and this. So and that way, I've sort of processed it there and then. And by being efficient with my thoughts, they no longer consume me and therefore harm me. Because you've also got to give yourself a break. So if you're working on your own self-development and wanting to be better in areas that you know that you aren't great at, so like I say, for me, I make these mistakes often, I still make them, but I have a way of now giving some compassion to myself. So I don't get so caught up in the what ifs and 
oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should apologize. I should make it really clear what I was saying because she's going to think this, this and this. But actually, that's not what I meant. I meant this. And what I do now is I just sort of go, do you know what? You're human and you are actively working on yourself. So you you recognize that these behaviors happen. But by beating myself up, I'm just going to harm myself more. So instead of beating myself up, I just literally note it. And then the next time I speak to that person, I make sure that I am in that awareness state of mind so I can be careful with what I say, which will then lead to less overthinking later. <laughs> so how can you start managing your overthinking? So firstly, it's just that. It's managing. Rome wasn't built in a day. Your overthinking didn't just appear one day. There's work to be done and it will take time. If anxiety has taken a hold, then it'll also be a bit harder, but it is possible. And like I say, it's a choice. It's up to you if you want to do it. It's up to you if you want to raise your self-awareness. It's up to you if you want to change this behavior. If it's sort of crippling you, if it's making you not trust people or not be able to go about your day-to-day -day in the way you want to make that active choice to start managing it and then essentially eventually I mean we could be talking when you're sort of 80 90 <laughs> it might be eradicated completely but the fact that you're working on it is the most important step so start by making the choice to stop overthinking. This in itself could be a mammoth task. So you must allow yourself some time to evaluate how overthinking makes you feel. And I mean how it feels in your entire body. Because sometimes when we do things in our brain, it does actually affect our physicality. See if you tense up, see what your jaw feels like. You know, all these things happen. Do you get like a pit in your stomach? Then reflect on the other negative things that are happening when you overthink, like irrational thoughts, being overly judgmental, uh, not seeing the other side of a situation. And once you've decided that you want to make this change, start reflecting on where this overthinking comes from. What triggers you to overthink? So it could be something, you know, it could be something from the past that's a template, but it keeps coming up in work scenarios or it keeps coming up in friendships or it keeps coming up in relationships, love relationships. So have a think about where it comes from, what your triggers are. And once you know that, you can start to look at solutions to manage those triggers. And this could be anything from going for a walk, meditating, socializing, listening to music, anything that helps you quiet your mind. And if you still can't quiet your mind, go back to why you want to make this change. So go back to how it makes you feel when you overthink and why you're listening to this podcast and looking for some help to change it. How do you want to feel without being an overthinker? What's that going to look like for you? You know, if you're not an overthinker, how is life going to look? Is it going to be easier? Is it going to be more comfortable? Are you going to be happier? And finally, give it time. It will take time to adjust these behavior patterns, but it can be done. Actively choosing to change your behavior. Now, that's the first step in making it happen, but... Please, please, please allow yourself some time to do this. You can practice it in your everyday situations with the thoughts that come into your mind that are easier to manage and see how you go. But giving yourself adequate time, and I'm saying, like, don't put a time limit on it, but just know that undoing really hard limiting beliefs, templates that have been ingrained for so long, they do take time to unravel and find solutions because you've got to trial and error you've got to try different things to help you through it you've got to try different techniques to get you there it's all about your mindset how that's going to change and then how it is going to affect you in a positive way so just give it some time it will happen and obviously I am here if you need more pointers you can work with me one-on-one -on -one. and a shameless promotion right now if this is something or anything actually that you've been listening to on the podcast that really speaks to you and you know that you need to address it to make your life better, then I am hosting a retreat on the 2nd of March in India. It's a luxury retreat. It's a very, very beautiful place that we're going to stay at. And this time away, 
you can really get to the root of what you're trying to work on. You really can. You can improve your self-confidence. You can work on any goals like career direction, things like that. Any relationship issues you have or dating challenges that you're going through. Anything that you're struggling with in your life can be addressed at this trip. And I promise you transformational changes when you come back because it's that effective. Have a look at my testimonials on my website. You can see it right there. The trip itself is going to be insanely good. Honestly, I design these trips really well. <laughs> Trust me. So have a look. Have a look on the website. Get some information. If you want to know if it would work for you, just give me a call. I am accessible. I wish you the best with your overthinking. <laughs> now you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to end up overthinking the content of this podcast and be like, actually, I should have said this and I should have said that. And why did I say this? I should have put this at the beginning and I should have done this at the end. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to do that and lead by example. I'm going to be, yep, okay, podcast is done. I hope it's helpful. And like I say, if you need anything else, give me a shout. Thank you for listening to the Self Care 101 podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you would subscribe and review so that other people like you can find the show. For more tips and tricks, you can follow me on the socials at Frankly Coaching or visit my website to find out more about my coaching programs and how to work with me at franklycoaching.com.